Hello, and welcome to today's webcast, brought to you by Pen Energy and sponsored by Sapient Consulting. I am Joey Michelle Spinner, Chief Editor of Pen Energy, and I'll be moderating today's webcast. Thank you very much for joining us. This presentation is live and interactive, so you can ask questions at any time by clicking in the Ask a Question box in the presentation window and then clicking the Submit button. If you are running pop-up blocking software, you will need to disable it to view this webcast. In addition, it is recommended that you close down all other applications for better performance. For your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of this live event. A reminder email message will be sent to all registrants with a link to the archive. It will also be accessible from the homepage at www.pinenergy.com. A PDF of the slide deck will be available in the Event Resources section. Today's event, Intelligent Robotic Process Automation, a Strategic Edge for the Oil and Gas Industry, will be presented by Amit Singh, Senior Director and Global RPA Lead at Sapient Consulting, and Conrad Vanderpool, Managing Director at UiPath. And now, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Amit Singh. Thanks, Joey. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to cover what we already know. Um, so what we know so far is that we are at the beginning of the most transformative revolution ever, and what the World Economic Forum is calling the fourth industrial revolution, or the connected intelligence age. There have been three industries prior to the connected intelligent economy, uh, namely agricultural, manufacturing, and information age. We also know that the connected intelligent age is evolving at a very, very rapid pace, so much so that the technology landscape is evolving faster than budget cycles. And we also know that there'll be big winners and big losers from this change. Analysts are seeing early indications of AI-first companies growing eight times faster than average companies. So the question is, what does the connected intelligent future looks like for enterprises? So broadly speaking, there are three things that enterprises are doing today. And the first aspect of the connected intelligent economy is to eradicate repetitive tasks, and RPA sits front and center to that idea. The second has to do with automating insight generation, and the idea here is to extract previously unknown insights from structured and unstructured data to identify and act on recommended actions, and also to take advantage of these opportunities that are being discovered. Uh, what's happening is this is leading to creation of new business lines uh, that were not possible or commercially infeasible just a few years back. The third vertical has to do with amplifying human intelligence, and, and the idea here is to simplify the work that, that people are doing within the enterprises. So think about Alexa and Siri uh, for enterprises when you think about amplifying human intelligence. Some of you may have seen some of the latest uh, latest development in the amplifying human intelligence space um, uh, with Google. So Google just released a new version of amplifying human intelligence where you would have a personal assistant making calls and reservations for you, and it's very, very interactive. Um, the idea uh, and the conversation today uh, is largely to see how can RPA be combined with AI and machine learning tools, and how can this be an enabler for automating insight generation and amplifying human intelligence, I would like to pass on to Conrad now, who can walk us through the UiPath journey so far and plans for the future, especially in the area of enabling AI and machine learning. Amit, thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thrilled to be uh, with you and uh, share our experiences um, at UiPath in the uh, intelligent RPA uh, space. So UiPath is, is in essence, uh, the, the slow fruit of a group of engineers uh, driven by uh, an enduring ambition to build the best technology that uh, that possibly could, right? Um, they went in wholeheartedly and, and made UiPath the most widely used RPA platform in the world today, uh, drawing together both elite enterprises and global partners such as such as Sapiens, committed to excellence in implementing and producing innovations, um, and really the largest RPA developer community ready to make an impact on the world. Um, we continue to encourage the best minds to contribute and create the next leap in RPA. We have we have more than 120,000 developers of all ranks building upon the free UiPath community edition today. 
Um, and to, to support this growing pool of talent, we brought the UFF Academy uh, to the market as really the first open and online training and certification platform dedicated to the RPA users. More than 55,000 users spanning all continents have already enrolled in at least one of our online courses since its launch um, a little over a year ago. Um, so, so global expansion uh, in terms of our, our, our journey is really where we are today. Uh, we have, as the slide says, about 10 global offices, 700 customers, uh, 500 plus staff. As a matter of fact, I would say these, these figures are actually outdated uh, because we're, we're uh, growing so fast. So there's a, there's a tremendous, uh, tremendous amount uh, going on. And looking forward, um, uh, it's interesting to, uh, to see where this goes, right? Uh, in 2018, we're executing actively on, on what we call uh, the path to AI. Um, and that means several things, right? Uh, first of all, uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, uh, to lock up a deal with uh, with Excel and Google and Kleiner Perkins a few months ago uh, in a Series B event, uh, really with their recognition of uh, not just the, the potential for UiPath, but the, for the potential of the space, which is which is a combination of, uh, of RPA and AI. We currently uh, are on path to uh, about 2,200 customers in 16 countries and, uh, and about 1,200 employees. Um, and our, and our uh, uh, tremendous group of engineers is working actively to, uh, to work on hundreds of in integrations from Google Cloud Natural Language to Standard Core, Stanford Core, Microsoft, Google Translate, and so forth. We see and are already working on um, uh, the fact that, that you know, rules-based has been a fundamental prerequisite for robotic automation, uh, but experience-based is really where this is going, and uh, increasingly we're, uh, we're working with customers to, to make that a reality. Experience-based is really the machine learning-based enhancement of RPA, wherein robotics learn from experience just as humans do in on-the-job or shadowing training, right? And it's really the power of RPA in, in the fact that it's a digitized process and provides the ability to collect and disseminate and evaluate data uh, for machine learning engines uh, to become smarter and smarter and such uh, and as such augment the process. Um, in, in addition, we're working actively on an open marketplace, right, of thousands of automations and models and algorithms and, and building blocks uh, in a free and extensible way uh, for the markets, but also for large enterprises to run their own uh, sort of private marketplace, if you will, for continued sharing. And increasingly, we end up uh, in a place in a couple of years where digital workers uh, will be engaging human workers in, in language and regioning uh, enhance an autonomous experience. Um, robots with deep learning for self-healing operations, and that's, and that's really the amazing thing, right? I mean, today's robots are pretty cool. Uh, but the fact that, that soon they'll be able to, to self-heal operations and handle exceptions uh, without having to be programmed specifically for it. Uh, we envision you know, a global community with, with over a million of, of UiPath RPA developers and 10,000 uh, enterprise customers and government agencies uh, just, just around the corner. Um, so what, is this, what does this really mean to you, right? I mean, what is this, uh, this world of robots? Um, you know, up to now, it's, it's, it's the way we think about it. Robots really have, have sort of our reptilian brain, if you will, the one that controls our heartbeat and breathing and, and following the rules and printing thousands of years ago. But experience-based robotics really requires a cognitive brain, the one we use for decision-making. Uh, and the incorporation of machine learning models really into, into robots is going to make that possible. Of course, the, the other benefits of, of robots, and by the way, for, for, for all the avoidance of doubt, uh, software robots are pieces of software and not, not physical robots, right? Um, they already perfectly emulate human worker repetitive tasks through a user interface today, simply logging into, uh, into the applications that they use. Um, and they act as the hands and the feet and the eyes, and soon as the brains as well. Clearly no coffee breaks, no vacations, and bots work. Uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, it is it is really the the ideal worker, if you will. Um, it's worth I think also I mean just to just to highlight what what bots really uh, do on a on a day to day basis. What are the tasks that they perform in practical terms? Um, you know they do things like you know opening and extracting data from 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 PDFs or other uh, input sources. They log into web applications. They 
they read Citrix terminal sessions. They open, you know, any of your ERP or any other applications uh, that are that are office centric. They fill in forms. Uh, they read and write the databases, right? And uh, uh, they do all of that using sort of if then else decision making rules. Uh, they connect to systems, APIs. Uh, they make calculations and so forth, right? All the tasks that uh, uh, that that systems perform today. Uh, bots can actually do for you. And the benefit of, of the way they do it is it, it's very non-invasive, meaning you don't actually have to integrate a robot into Salesforce.com or into Oracle or into SAP. No, you simply need to provide it with a login and a password, right? And, and uh, it, can, it can operate and do its work from then on. Also, I think useful for the audience to understand that there's sort of different types of bots. Um, there is attended robots that, that really interact with humans on a desktop, often in a front office or in a call center or a contact center environment where uh, a contact center will, uh, agent will be interacting with a customer, will be interacting uh, with an employee. Uh, but part of that interaction demands some level of automation of tasks. Um, in, in, in sort of any kind of uh, uh, sequence, if you will, um, and uh, the bot can, can, can really support the agent in that capacity. There's also unattended robots that they really execute an entire function, often in a back office, fully automated, typically triggered you know, on a clock by the presence of a file or any other sort of event that is recognizable by a robot. Uh, and of course, you can then combine those two uh, in a hybrid RPA environment, uh, automations that combine both attended and unattended tasks um, and one of the beauties of, of UR Path technology is, is that you know, both types of robots are uh, uh, designed and operated uh, in the same, uh, the same environment. So what are, they, what are sort of the compelling benefits then for, uh, uh, of RPA? And, and here again, I think, I think, I think RPA is, is proving them itself to be something, something beyond the benefits of, of, of uh, ERP or other systems uh, from the past. Um, the great thing is, is that there is a multitude of potential outcomes uh, for the enterprise, uh, for your customers, for your employees, right? Um, once you go uh, and automate and digitize processes, it really enables you to, to go 100% digital in your interaction with your employees or with your customers. Um, the, the, the productivity boost uh, that, that is potential uh, that, that is possible is, I mean, we're literally just scratching the surface yet, um, uh, but it is, it is, it is uh, uh, a major part of, uh, uh, of the reason for, for RPA being as successful as it is today. Um, there also is the potential for simply scaling workers to meet uh, growing demand, right? If, if uh, a worker performs interactions with a customer and part of its task is to do administrative work, which you then automate, you free up the capacity that uh, that worker actually has to uh, perhaps generate demand or do other things. Um, another benefit really is is there's the continuous opportunity to learn through the experience and digitize that learning, right? A bot continuously can get smarter um, and, uh, and 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 establish sort of a new baseline of what it what it knows and can do. Clearly, customer inter inter satisfaction already benefits from from bots today. Um, and, and importantly, and sometimes forgotten, is the fact that job satisfaction uh, really will benefit uh, from, uh, from RPA as well, uh, simply because the mundane and, and boring and repetitive tasks uh, for many, uh, many a worker uh, is going to be automatable. And as a result, uh, employees find uh, and employers find that uh, uh, the talent can be, can be further mined, if you will, by deploying it to uh, to higher end uh, tasks. So tremendous amount of benefits uh, being, being achieved by uh, RPA users today. Um, Amit? Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Just to extend to what Conrad said, um, we at Sapient are seeing the advancement in technology, both in the field of perception and cognition, combined with RPA 
leading to some very, very interesting use cases that can be developed. So on the perception side, be it C touch feel, uh, one interesting use case that we saw with the fuel retailer was to automate handwritten invoices, and it, it wasn't possible to automate handwritten invoices uh, probably a couple of years back, but now with the advancement of intelligent character recognition as opposed to just optical character recognition, you can now automate even handwritten invoices. And same thing we're seeing on the cognition side, so be it reasoning and decision making, uh, you can extend the degree of automation and we're seeing more and more adoption of RPA combined with some of the cognitive agent tools to automate, uh, let's say, call center operations. So in, in cases where you need to make subjective decisions, uh, you can invoke a cognitive bot to make those decisions for you and hand over any kind of exceptions for the human. So, so definitely we're seeing quite a few use cases being implemented where we have uh, a combination of RPA and AI. So um, if you look at some of the industry analyst reports, um, you will quickly come to the conclusion that RPA is going to disrupt the service industry in a big way, um, perhaps one of the biggest disruptions since the offshoring phenomena. Uh, McKenzie estimates that 30 to 45 percent of all activities that we do currently can be automated, uh, leading to, to a staggering $7.5 trillion in rule-based work. Uh, if you look at some of the estimates on the efficiency gains, depending upon the analyst and depending upon your experience, it ranges anywhere between 40 to 80 percent, but, but the numbers are huge in terms of efficiency gains that's possible through the use of uh, robotic process automation. Um, if you look at Forrester's report, uh, Forrester is estimating that we'll end up with at least 4 million bots uh, in North America alone doing office work by 2021, and that's a significant uh, number if you look at number of people doing office job in North America alone, and the projected market size is, is just uh, growing at a very, very rapid rapid pace, um, uh, as Conrad mentioned earlier, um, I mean, I'll say probably five to six years back, uh, the market was in millions of dollars, and, and it's gaining a lot of popularity, and there are enterprises that are realizing the benefit, uh, and we see, uh, and many of the analyst, uh, analyst reports allude to the fact that we will see an exponential growth uh, in, in, the, in the market capitalization uh, for RPA companies. Conrad. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another thing to, uh, to to realize, right, is uh, just building on that is that obviously as humans we were meant to be creative. I mean, if you think about it, on average, um, you know, managers spend spend two full days a week on administrative activities, um, and in the U.S., approximately you know 575 billion per year is spent performing administrative work. Now, we're not saying that all of that will be automated, uh, but a significant portion is going to be able to be automated, you know, freeing up a tremendous capacity uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the U.S. economy today. Um, millennial employees would rather, uh, you know, and this is studies have borne this out, would rather make 40000 a year doing a job they love as opposed to making, making a lot more per year doing, uh, doing something, uh, something boring. Um, and, and once you apply the automation to remove mundane tasks from a person, this, this you know, can bring them joy, and that uh, the person really becomes more valuable to the, uh, to the enterprise. Um, you know, at UI Path, we've, we've, we've uh, you know, developed a, a tremendous list of very large customers uh, in the oil and gas industry as well as in many other industries. Um, and this, and this uh, outcome uh, keeps kind of surprising our customers. Um, the fact that uh, once you automate and start really slicing away at the boring work uh, in, a, in a department um, and you free up the capacity uh, to do other things, um, that, that, that actually produces you know, better outcomes uh, for that department as a whole. Now, we're not saying that, uh, that customers don't seek to, uh, to achieve productivity gains uh, through RPA, um, but this side benefit is, uh, is certainly something that, uh, uh, that, is, that is surprising many of our, our customers. Uh, I mean. Yeah, so if you look at the spectrum of automation, um, it starts with action automation, and action automation effectively means a bunch of actions that you do on the screens, be it clicking on certain buttons, entering information on certain fields, so on and so forth. And then the next stage on automation is analysis. Uh, a, w a point worth understanding is there are very few few. Uh, tasks within the enterprises or few jobs that just does action, which is effectively just clicking on buttons or entering information, although there are 
uh, I would say, uh, some percentage of tasks within the enterprises that involves action. But largely, the, uh, the idea is to perform some sort of analysis on the data before you enter that information. And that's the next step of automation, which has to do with analysis. Um, Today, with the use of uh, automation tools like robotic process automation, uh, really action and analysis have become table stakes. Um, so uh, we can use um, RPA tools like UiPath to pretty much automate most of the action and, and, and most of the analysis pieces uh, that's being done um, at, uh, within the enterprises. The next step um, in a process has to do with decision making, and that's where uh, now we're seeing combining AI and RPA play because uh, a lot of decision making uh, is subjective in, in enterprises. In, in some cases, especially back office operations, it can be rule based. And any rule based task can again be very easily automated. But when you think about automation in, in, in the case of front office, uh, think about trading as an example. The decision automation is fairly, decision is fairly complex and automating it would require uh, some sort of a cognitive agent to understand all the variables and make decisions for you. And we're seeing uh, more and more adoption uh, of, uh, of tools uh, that combine RPA and, and a cognitive agent to be able to deliver, deliver that, that, that sort of experience for enterprises. Um, the last one has to do with self-learning, and the idea here is similar to humans, can the bots learn through exception handling processes? And, and we're seeing, uh, and UiPath is one of, the, one of the product vendors that's actively working on a roadmap to enable self-learning and self-healing through deep learning, as Conrad mentioned earlier. And the idea here is uh, to make sure that the bots can learn through exception management as opposed to uh, exception management being handled uh, by the humans. So if you look at the spectrum of automation and the advancement of technology, especially in the field of AI, you'll see that more and more degree of automation is possible. So probably a few years back, you could have been, uh, you would have been in a position where you could automate step one to four out of a 10 step process. But now through the use of uh, some of the uh, AI related tools and, and through the advancement in technology uh, as part of robotic process automation, you can extend that and, and probably go to eight or nine and, and really manage by exceptions. Uh, so that's the idea around, um, around the spectrum of automation. Right. Yeah, and another way to, to look at that same spectrum, um, Amit, and, and you know this, is that uh, so, so, so many of process has sort of a happy path, right, where let's say 60, 70% of, of a set of transactions will follow that path. Um, and, you know, that requires a lot of times a, a straightforward set of, uh, set of rules and is, and is totally automatable today. Um, it is really how you, how you deal with the exceptions. Um, uh, where where the uh, uh, the power of intelligent RPA uh, becomes uh, becomes obvious, um, and Amit was talking about this already earlier. The ability of a, of, a, of a robot process, robotic process, to learn uh, from the exceptions, uh, identify patterns in the exceptions, um, is uh, is what makes intelligent RPA so powerful. And the way you think about this is, let's say there's you know 30% exceptions being uh, being identified in a robotic process today, um, those 30% would would be would be processed um, in the way they are done today, and a lot of times that involves some level of of, of manual intervention. Um, the robot can actually uh, track and, uh, and 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 analyze, you know, how today those 30% of transactions uh, are being uh, being handled. And uh, the learning aspect is in uh, identifying the patterns uh, in those exceptions, right? And uh, um, uh, it'll 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 start chipping away at that 30%, if you will. If 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 every time an invoice comes in, you know, from a certain set of vendors, um, and and it and it identifies a pattern uh, in which those exceptions are being processed, it is going to be in position to recommend. Uh, a way to then automate or uh, process it automatically, you know, going forward. Um, and the engine can be set up such that that, that uh, exception then gets recommended and reviewed uh, by the user or by, uh, uh, by the IT team, if you will, uh, but such that the 30%, you know, becomes less and less and less. Um, and that is, that is uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that RPA makes so powerful. You can essentially start with the happy path of an automation recognizing that the exceptions can still be processed as they are done today. Um, 
the other aspect and on the slide here uh, of, of of intelligent rpa is, is it's of course it's really the application of artificial intelligence and related technologies including computer vision uh, and, and cognitive and machine learning uh, to what to what uh, today is you know sort of rpa in its in its own right um and uh, and UiPath does does this today. By the way, good examples uh, are computer vision. Computer vision uh, is really the ability of a robot uh, to penetrate uh, the attributes of a uh, of an application that's on a screen, um, and as such, interpret uh, you know the uh, uh, the the application's window, um, and not have to rely on the visual aspects of the uh, of the window itself. Uh, so so our uh, technology doesn't actually rely on its position, right, or the relative position of a field and a label. No, it, it simply looks at the attributes uh, of, uh, of a window, um, and that we do today. Intelligent OCR is another good example. Intelligent uh, optical character recognition um, is um, a, a really strong engine uh, that, uh, that understands how to uh, assess and evaluate incoming, you know, PDFs or semi-structured data sources uh, and recognize patterns in them uh, and recommend them for, for processing and classification uh, such that the degree of automation in that particular process, whether it's invoice processing or something else, uh, goes, uh, goes, goes up. And this conversion of technologies really results in, in automation capabilities uh, that dramatically elevate business value and competitive advantages, right? At the end of the day, the objective is for a process to be fully automated, uh, its happy path as well as, uh, as all its exception uh, routes, if you will. So um, it's it's good to think about this sort of uh, in in a roadmap, and uh, uh, you know some of some of the listeners may may recognize uh, this this set of slides. We have uh, we have sort of a metro map, if you will, of different paths of, of development that we uh, uh, that we use to uh, to bring to life. You know how we evolve uh, the technology that's out there, um, and on this slide. You know, from 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 machine to human-like uh, decision making, um, we we de we depict the fact that there's computer vision, which is which is really reliable optical uh, object recognition in, in images on the user interface, including Citrix and and, and converting semi-structured data, as I was mentioning, uh, to machine learning, really, is, which is the classification and data extraction based on historic transaction data. Uh, as I described before, um, as well as language, right? really the intent identification and, and uh, information extraction of, of unstructured to structured data uh, uh, from, from a variety of language sources, um, all the way to reasoning, right, where, where the robot is going to be in position to understand the ramification of a business process um, and why a certain uh, decision uh, should, be, should be contemplated. Uh, and and that's that kind of artificial intelligence is is really what uh, what we've been talking about in this uh, in this call um, and is is right around the corner in the in the automation space. Amit. Yes. Um, so we wanted to walk you through an example in the automation automating insight uh, area of how RPA combined with AI tools is enabling insights that were previously not possible. Uh, so we worked on a project that started with an ISO, an independent service operator in the Northeast, and the problem statement was that they were looking at pipeline notices, and the pipeline notices were varied, uh, and it varied by uh, different types of pipeline companies. Uh, the format was different, plus the information in, in the notices were also hugely different from one pipeline company to the other, and, 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 the, and the ISO had deployed a team of people that would just read through the information, identify the constraints on the pipeline, and then figure out the disruption uh, that was being caused because of the constraint, and then uh, evaluate the supply-demand balances. And the reason it was important to do that was to figure out the electricity impact, because as you may know, uh, there are more and more uh, gas-fired plants as opposed to any other, uh, any other different types of uh, power plants. Um, and, and that's causing an increased dependency on, on gas pipelines being able to deliver uh, gas on time. And, and as you may know, gas is a just-in-time fuel, um, and there are several constraints with respect to transporting gas. Um, so given that, uh, we were able to automate uh, almost all the information uh, from the different pipeline companies in different formats using an RPA tool, uh, which in this case was UiPath, uh, and being able to combine that information 
and then run a machine learning model on top of it to be able to predict the constraints by adding some of the other elements like weather data. Um, so that was hugely beneficial because there was probably about 10 or 12 people looking at the information and they could only look at the information, uh, only look at so much information and it used to take a lot of time from, and we were able to cut down the time that it took to analyze the notices from several hours to actually a couple of minutes. Um, so, for, so from there on, we, we used this for, um, for a large power trading company where the problem statement was kind of similar, where they wanted to predict the natural gas uh, spot prices as well as uh, get a view on the inventory of natural gas. And, and the idea was, again, very similar, like I said, uh, to gather information on, uh, on the supply-demand balances from EIA. So on the top uh, quadrant that you see, you have the inventory and spot prices, and historical information is readily available. Uh, the natural gas demand uh, is also readily available from the EIA, EIA website, and we were able to pull 17 years' worth of history of that information. What was difficult to, to get was the unstructured information, uh, largely the pipeline constraint information, and we were able to get that information through the use of an RPA tool. And now, uh, through the combination of the unstructured information, which wasn't possible for us to extract previously, uh, plus a combination of the previously available information namely inventory and spot prices and the natural gas demand, we were able to combine all of this information to predict the spot prices as well as the, the storage inventory for, uh, uh, for, for gas. And that's hugely valuable. Um, so these are the type of insights that is possible to generate. And this is just one example. But there are several other examples where RPA uh, is, is acting as a tool, uh, which is a foundation, uh, not just for generating efficiency and reducing cost, but also to connect uh, data system processes and technology so that you can leverage the full power of connected intelligence. On that. Over to you, Conrad. Yeah, sorry, um, I was on mute there. Yeah, so we're very proud at UFS to uh, to count uh, 16 of the largest oil and gas uh, companies in the Americas uh, as uh, as customers, and uh, it's it's very interesting to see um, you know what uh, where they start, right? Then obviously, and we get the question, you know, how does RPA really use uh, get used in, in oil and gas, but um, uh, many of the of, of our customers start in what, what are really the horizontal functions across the company. Uh, the obvious places are finance and accounting and treasury, but also HR, legal, uh, and increasingly contact centers and customer service uh, through the use of attended bots, like like I mentioned earlier, uh, supply chain and and, and and shared service organizations, all obvious places uh, for for customers to to start. Um, and, and other examples, and, 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 and these, these examples here uh, predominantly are, are sort of upstream uh, examples, but uh, um, uh, we, will, we will talk about some downstream examples as well. But, you know, um, if you think about exploration analytics and analysis, you know, really behind the, the dominating uh, presence of, of innovation, uh, innovative technologies within exploration and production operations, the fact that historical data plays an important role uh, in the analytics is often overlooked, and, and not only is pulling this historical data from various sources really difficult and time-consuming, uh, the volume of mergers in the oil and gas industry in recent years has really aggregated uh, legacy data silos and, and made the sourcing and retrieval of this information more challenging, and, and RPA is very well positioned to, uh, to assist in that. Um, from a uh, from a production uh, analysis, uh, just as airlines live or die by flight load and scheduling calculations, so 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 to well production analysis and um, and, and resulting operate and, and cap decisions impact the top line of, of the oil and gas industry. And the challenge has been that the, that the sheer volume of these decisions made it impractical to more than uh, than a statistical sampling of of quality control. And with RPA, quality can, control can extend into each decision and even fractional improvements in accuracy mean uh, or can mean significant uh, uh, revenues. Um, from an industrial automation integration perspective, oil and gas companies use many different um, uh, automation applications, uh, industrial automation applications, all of which have their own technologies and standards and sensors. Uh, and many of those applications require customization to work well with each 
individual companies operations and, and RPA technology can can be used very well to integrate reporting from all these systems uh, and provide a unified uh, reporting perspective um, on the, on the drilling side, operational reporting, uh, just the same way, right? Uh, similar situations exist, and, uh, and even in well-automated areas like asset management, there's a broad range of data around rig maintenance and repair that needs to be pulled from, from lots of databases for compliance and, uh, and operational reporting. And speaking of compliance, uh, just as RPA uh, can pull data from disparate systems for comprehensive reporting, it can also pull a different configuration of the information to automatically fulfill industry and governmental compliance requirements um, and and bots do this stuff really well uh, it's 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 important to repeat that bots don't make mistakes uh, bots do exactly what you want them to do and do it the same way uh, perfectly every time uh, and that zero error rate uh, is a significant output of, uh, of a fully automated uh, process the drilling performance uh, can be optimized with with uh, with really intelligent RPA by using feedback loops to automatically optimize, uh, for instance, the uh, the drill's weight on bit uh, WOB and rotations per minute uh, and similar um, similar KPIs. Um, Amit, I think you have a few additional uh, examples on this slide. Yeah, so I think um, there are quite a few examples. So depending upon the type of industry within oil and gas, uh, be it a fuel retailer, uh, and largely if you're a fuel retailer, the problems are slightly different. You're looking at automating some of the store-related things. You're looking at figuring out the distribution and supply chain, and there are a bunch of things both within logistics and, and the operations within these stores that can be automated using using RPA. Uh, if you're a midstream organization, there are some interesting use cases with respect to safety uh, that we have implemented, and, and those are innovative ways where you don't have to calculate the maximum operating pressure, and you can have a bot uh, do that for you, and it can be attended or unattended depending upon the requirement that you have. It can uh, really trigger based on, a, based on a preconceived or predetermined set of steps. Uh, that you have within the organization. Uh, same thing um, on the downstream side, right? So there's, there's quite, a bit, quite a bit of applicability uh, with respect to figuring out uh, just the pricing information. We've seen um, bots being applied where you do complex calculations to determine prices, uh, and there are uh, use cases that we have built uh, that can help uh, expedite that process for you as opposed to you spending a lot of time. Some of the other areas um, within oil and gas, especially in the field of logistics where time compression leads to direct value generation, we've seen some of the use cases where uh, you, can, uh, you can deploy a bot. Uh, in one instance, we used the bot to, uh, to do ship wetting, and, and it could reduce the overall time that it takes to wet a ship from several hours to, to a few minutes. And of course, as you can imagine, uh, you aren't paying the demerage when you can wet the ship faster, it sails faster, and there's a lot of value associated with it. I think from an operation standpoint and, and back office operation particular, in particular is well understood and it cuts across industries, uh, but I think on the front office side as well, especially in the, in the, in the, in the field of supply and trading, uh, we are seeing a lot of, uh, lot of applicability of RPA, uh, especially from, from a commercial inside generation as well as uh, making sure that we free up traders' time uh, in 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 spend uh, basically reversing the the amount of time that the traders spend today in systems versus market and and that's another area where we're seeing RPA being applied. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about um, you know the benefits of RPA, how it applies into the oil and gas. Uh, space uh, perhaps uh, now let's close out the presentation by talking about you know how how customers can get started you know how do we uh, how, how does one can engage with this and uh, what are some of the prerequisites perhaps for getting the right results um, so so this is a fairly simple uh, but 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 powerful list right uh, not every process is a great candidate for automation uh, clearly the process needs to be stable uh, and it needs to be constant right um, I would add to that it needs to be well understood um, and uh, uh, we, we, we certainly experience uh, the odd customer where, um, uh, as we as we uh, support an automation, uh, how, how how the customer thinks the process is actually performing uh, is different from how it actually is working. So so having a stable process that is well understood is uh, is is key. Clearly, it needs to be an active process, um, and governance. Um, 
is is a critical part of this as well. Um, it's and, and and we talk about some of this on the next slide. But, but basically, what this means is that uh, you know it's easy to automate a process and have a bot perform it. Um, it it demands governance um, as you as you scale and deploy lots of bots, right? And it requires orchestration. It requires you know the understanding of the inputs and the outputs and the monitoring of the work that is being performed um, by by a robot. Um, you know, and that management of that work. Uh, to some degree, gets gets performed by an orchestration function in the technology, uh, but it still demands that uh, that people sort of look at what uh, what the result is. Clear rules and logic are a good place to start, right? Uh, we talked we talked a lot about uh, sort of the uh, the rules based automation and cognitive automation, and how the the one is an extension of the other. But most customers uh, tend to start with uh, with clear, clear rule uh, processes that have really good rules and and, and logic embedded into them. Um, and then, then a, a data consistency is important where, you know, the data sources and the data uh, embedded in applications uh, is, is consistent and, and clearly usable and, uh, and reliable. Um, perhaps then, uh, then talking more so about what the methodology can, uh, can be and should be to select processes. Um, uh, you obviously want to identify which process your company wants to automate and, and build a business case for each process, right? And, and estimate the benefits and, and consider the cost of implementation and operation. Um, and, and in many cases, our, our customers uh, are, are holding so the business process owner accountable for actually achieving the business case, right? If, if it means that uh, the same uh, process can be performed with, uh, with fewer resources, then, you know, at some point, um, the uh, the resources need to get redeployed, right? And that accountability for uh, the business case outcome is uh, is something that needs to be explicit. Uh, at least we recommend for it to be explicit. Evaluating the benefits and and, and assess potential risk of the RPA implementation um, is crucial as well. Uh, RPA can be used to automate and streamline enterprise function, uh, including back office uh, processing and IT operations. Um, but successful RPA deployment also manages other things, the impl implications of, of organizational changes, potentially large and transformational in nature, uh, technology infrastructure, system integration, uh, data security and privacy issues. Um, you know, the underlying technology uh, and certainly UI pods is, is, is supporting all those issues and considerations, but uh, uh, for, for a customer embarking on this, it's, it's important to, uh, to consider how best uh, to assess you know, the, uh, uh, the different angles of, uh, of an automated process. Uh, most customers stand up a center of excellence, by the way, uh, to, uh, uh, to perform and, uh, and manage and govern you know, the, uh, the automation of processes across different uh, departments. Clearly defined and communicated roles and responsibility of a deployment inside a center of excellence uh, are key, and uh, and and that COE needs to really be able to articulate the case for uh, for change, and then really ensuring that uh, that both uh, the business team and the technology department are on board. Uh, aligned leadership is really key for a technology like this that is so powerful and easy to use, uh, and in many customers' cases is really driven by the business community. Um, it's still uh, its deployment still requires that business and I, and uh, and IT are are well aligned. Um, you clearly want to choose uh, the RPA technology. We have a view on it, but uh, you know, determining uh, the technology solution, um, it, 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 the deployment is arguably one of the most crucial milestones along the RPA journey, since it defines the type of functionality and support you will have along that journey. And uh, at UiPath, we're very proud of our ability to work with customers throughout that journey. We recognize that customers, you know, start from a from a certain amount of knowledge and learning, uh, and learning base uh, at the start of the journey, and that uh, uh, and that the base grows uh, over time, and that um, interaction with the product vendor uh, and the partner like Sapiens uh, on a constant basis is going to be critical. Um, we also recommend that you want to want to begin the implementation process really as a controlled process, like with a pilot project in a smaller scale, focused implementation. You will be able to learn and tune your deployment and your your organization's response to this type of work um, to to better assess how to deploy uh, across the company in the longer term and to find relevant checkpoints to measure the success of this initial 
uh, focused RPA implementation, uh, understanding the deployment efforts and the resources required, and keep validating the business case. You know, keep validating why you're doing this and how well you know a pilot project is is actually performing uh, against against um, that business case, uh, including its assumptions on time savings or data accuracy, um, and adjust those assumptions as uh, as needed. And then lastly, really moving to a large-scale implementation, right? And uh, based on the implementation plan developed during the pilot, uh, typically with, with your partner, you'll be able to really begin the wider implementation of an RPA program. Um, taking advantage of the scalability of the technology to support the, the needed volume of robots uh, and deployment structure required by your company's business units, right? And that's, and that's fairly typical that uh, the different business units uh, go at this, uh, either in parallel or, or in sequence, but uh, typically, you know, orchestrated and managed through um, a, uh, a center of excellence uh, type uh, organization structure. Okay. Um, the last slide then, um, what, what should companies expect um, in terms of an ROI period? Uh, Amit. Yeah, I think um, largely if you look at the ROI, one of the reasons why RPA is gaining popularity is the fast return on investment. And even if you're thinking about a pilot of concept, you can easily implement RPA in anywhere between three to three to seven weeks. And, and that's the type of cycle that we're seeing um, of, uh, for implementing RPA bots. Uh, and that's very, very important. Uh, in many cases, if you think about some of these strategic initiatives um, within the organizations, it takes you one and a half to two years to realize a vision. And in many cases, that vision may not be relevant by the time you realize it. And RPA is one of the tools that quickly enabling the realization of the vision uh, fairly quickly right so and, and 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 the applicability of RPA is not just in the area of back office operations but also uh, in some of the strategic initiatives that you have uh, in some cases combining information across different platforms reconciling information uh, so on and so forth um, the idea uh, one of the other things that I wanted to highlight uh, based on what Conrad said I think uh, one very important aspect of, of doing RPA right is to evaluate the use cases uh, within the enterprise. And there is a methodology that we at Sapient have developed. Um, and the idea there is to, to make sure that we have a broad brush with respect to uh, different processes that you have in the organization, but also be able to calculate the ROI uh, as well as uh, the investment that you, that you need to make in terms of making sure that the process can be automated and, and the path uh, to sustenance is well understood uh, before you implement that. Uh, so that's really, um, really a uh, few things that you need to think about. Now, before we open uh, the webinar for q and I wanted to really understand where you are with respect to your RPA journey. So I'll send a survey to the audience and, and wait for 10, 15 seconds before I publish the results. So um, it's interesting. It looks like at least half of the audience hasn't started on an RPA journey. Um, about some of them are doing proof of concept uh, and pilot, and um, looks like that there are very, very few, probably just two users, who have deployed it at scale. And I will say uh, that's consistent with what we are seeing. Uh, Conrad, uh, you want to comment on the survey results so far? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I don't know if you intended to show uh, something. Um, I mean, because I don't, I don't think it is showing. But uh, now that's that's very consistent with the market is today. You know, um, so, so the penetration of the technology is, is in the marketplace is still less than ten percent. Uh, large companies uh, tend to sort of lead the way, um, and uh, you know, across industries, you, you know, you sort of see the same pattern, right? But uh, uh, but the, but the vast majority of companies out there. 
simply are just sort of in the stage of starting to look and starting to understand. And uh, obviously, that's one of the reasons we're doing webinars like this to uh, to help evangelize the uh, the potential of the uh, of the technology and uh, uh, and really how to go about you know getting started uh, for uh, for our potential customers. Awesome. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of the presentation, and we'll take the questions now. Um, Great. So, so the first question that we have is, um, how how is RPA different from any other ERP or BPM system tools? Uh, Conrad, do you want to address that? Yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to. Um, it is it is different in every possible way. <laughs> is is really the best way to put this. Um, so. So RPA is a technology um, that is non-invasive. Let's start with that difference, right? So there's there's no integration to uh, required to, to actually um, achieve real results. Um, RPA is a technology that sits sort of on top of, uh, you know, the existing um, uh, software stack that uh, that customers have. Uh, bots log in, and you don't need to integrate. You don't need to write interfaces. Bot simply log in. That is a major difference. Um, the ROI uh, that is achievable is is a number of months. Um, its speed of deploying is a number of weeks and months, um, and its cost uh, is a fraction of what a typical ERP of, or BPM system um, actually actually demands. So this is this is a technology that uh, that is that is easy to get to. It's easy to roll out. It tends to be driven, like I said earlier on the call, by by business communities versus an IT community, uh, even though the two need to go hand in hand. So, uh, like I said, it is it is it is different in the, uh, and modern, we think, uh, in, uh, in 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 every possible aspect from uh, from BPM and our ERP. Great. Um, we're going to try to get through most of these questions. We had quite a few. Um, Come in, and if your question does not get answered, um, our, present, our presenters will have those questions available to them after this presentation. So um, can you share some of the results of RPA initiatives that you've seen? Yeah, um, this is Conrad. So, so absolutely. So we have... Uh, we're involved in some of the largest um, UiPath pro or uh, RPA programs uh, in the world. Uh, you know, we have a very large uh, banking customer who is um, executing an RPA uh, an automation program uh, that is seeking to achieve a billion dollars uh, in uh, in corporate costs uh, over the next number of years, um, and they're well on track to do that uh, in the last in the last two years. Um, we see customers uh, looking to achieve efficiency gains, so so headcount uh, redeployment. Uh, of 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 twenty twenty five percent, and we're involved in programs like that. Um, we see uh, many transactions where the time um, it takes uh, a person uh, uh, to perform that transaction versus a robot uh, to be reduced by you know upwards of ninety five percent. Right. So all those are sort of different metrics, and 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 more than happy to provide many more sort of statistics, if you will. But uh, those are all sort of different potential ramifications from the very large to the to the, to the more process specific uh, that uh, that are outcomes that uh, that we're helping to deliver. Yeah, and just to add on to that, Joey, I think what we are also seeing is, uh, like I mentioned before, um, that it, it's not just cost reduction and efficiency gains. In, in many cases, we are seeing value addition. Uh, I'll cite an example. So for one of our customers, uh, we we automated the uh, the broker information uh, that the customer uh, was was supposed to look at before making trading decisions because that would give them better insight into the market. But they could previously look at only so much information, and they only had uh, so much sense of the market because of that. And the limitation was that the broker information came in different formats, uh, and somebody was manually compiling all of that information for traders to look at. But now, with the use of automation, you can really, there is no reason why you can't automate all the broker information and get a better sense of the market. So there are, there are use cases like those that, that's leading to some value generation as well. Thank you. Um, have you seen RPA used to track information in a gas utility for gas pipeline compliance? 
Tommy, do you want yes. to hit that one? Yes. Um, so, so from a compliance standpoint, compliance is a very good use case, um, in part because, um, as the name suggests, it's very rule-based. Uh, you you either do this or you don't do this, right? So, and 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 any kind of use case that are rule-based is is very good. It's a very good candidate for for automation. Uh, for a gas utility uh, specifically, when you're thinking about compliance, uh, you can very well monitor uh, all the aspects uh, from, a, from an operation standpoint and raise exceptions. And again, uh, raising exceptions, alert, and notification uh, specifically is a strength of an RPA tool. Uh, so definitely we've seen uh, implementations uh, for gas utility in, in, in the area of compliance. Do you have anything to add, Conrad? No, I think that covers it. Thank you. Okay. What is the manager to developers to bots ratio you've seen? Um, I, I'm not sure that I fully understand the question. Um, uh, I, I would imagine that the question relates to the to an implementation program, right? Uh, if that's the case, I mean, I think you're a better position to uh, to address that. Yeah, so I would say, I mean, the, we've seen very lean implementations uh, with very, very little oversight uh, as opposed to traditional SDLC that requires uh, a massive percentage of oversight for implementing uh, implementing bots. Uh, and, that, and the reason is because it's very iterative, right? So um, it is... Um, it is typically a six to eight week uh, implementation, like I said, and and we we see that the bot to manager ratio, people who are supposed to manage uh, the projects, there are different streams, and invariably within enterprises, you would end up having several bots being uh, being implemented in parallel, uh, and in those cases, you would end up having, uh, let's say, a percentage of somebody's time to to provide oversight. To, to ensure that we are adhering to a certain process that's been outlined. But largely, I think what we are seeing is it's a combination of, of uh, people who have the business context, uh, people who have, uh, who have RPA understanding, people who develop the bots, and, and in many cases, people who have application understanding and some experience design understanding. So the experience design and the business understand, understanding is, uh, is, is effectively covered by a business analyst. And the reason it's important to cover all these four dimensions is because uh, you are effectively uh, emulating a human being and you are encapsulating the human understanding in a bot. So you need to make sure you're covering the four aspects. Uh, so we're seeing uh, more and more business analysts plus, uh, plus bot developers with, with very little oversight. Great. Um, here's a, a question I heard a lot of last week at OTC. So do you have any general feedback on the acceptance and potential staff reduction? Yeah, no, so this is, uh, this is of course, a sensitive topic, right? And, uh, you know, where, where the market is uh, developing, you know, technologies, including our own, uh, that have, that have, um, a real impact on how enterprises perform. Uh, there is the reality uh, that individuals' jobs can can uh, be impacted. Um, as a company, uh, we believe that we uh, enable and empower workers to do more exciting work. Um, we actively uh, support the development of um, uh, uh, programs at universities to bring more people into the automation space. Uh, but the reality is that uh, the customers uh, you know, seek to gain efficiencies uh, and and redeploy staff, and sometimes let staff go as uh, as part of this program. Um, you know, there's 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 a lot of different ways in which customers uh, achieve benefits from from RPA, but productivity gains is a major one. I don't have any statistics for you, if you will, uh, but I would say that we're uh, closely working with our customers to uh, to handle you know that part of the process as well as we can. Right. In regards to RPA technology, what company or companies are leading in the development of AI and how it integrates with RPA? Well, I think I think uh, Amit, I think you have a broad view. You, you know, we we're experiencing a tremendous amount of growth at, at UiPath, and and one of the key 
reasons for uh, for customers selecting our technology over our competitors uh, is, is not just that it's that it's uh, terrifically well performing today and it takes significantly less time uh, to automate processes uh, using UI path technology versus any other competitor out there um, but also because of you know the broad um, uh, set of technologies that we enable customers to use, right? Whether it's technology that's embedded in uh, in UiPath, uh, from computer vision to intelligent OCR uh, to to natural language processing and other things, uh, to AI and cognitive engine uh, uh, investments that customers have already made. You know, many of our customers uh, that are uh, IBM Watson customers um, have combined to do, and it's it's uh, it's UiPath bots that. Uh, that kick off and, and interrogate, you know, an IBM Watson database. Uh, same with Google Analytics, right? So uh, it isn't so much that uh, our vision certainly is to create uh, an ecosystem of technologies uh, that, that customers include, uh, can use, including our own and including the ones that, uh, that are leading the marketplace. Um, and an open, extensible uh, architecture is critical uh, for that, and uh, like I said, uh, from our perspective, that's that's one of the one of the one of the leading reasons that uh, that we get selected over our competition. I mean, anything yeah, to add to that? You know, I, I would say I, I definitely agree with Conrad. I think UiPath has has, has been championing the whole idea of of venturing into the AI space, um, and and it's it's they've been really pioneers in terms of making sure that we combine RPA and AI, but, but I would say um, most RPA vendors uh, have a technology alliance partnership program uh, now, uh, and what it does is it really enables the use of uh, the RPA capability that they are providing plus being able to integrate with some of the some of the AI tools that's available in the market, be it the Microsoft Cortana suite or be it Google Analytics and AI. Thank you. Um, this is a good question. How does one decide um, in the decision process between selecting RPA or upgrading their existing application infrastructure? Yeah, no, it's 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 a great question, uh, and many customers face this today. Um, what what I would say is that there is that there's a multitude of reasons why customers select you know robotic process automation technology today. Um, in some cases, customers say, "I want to." I want to really build, you know, an automation framework across my enterprise, and I'm going to, I'm going to select a tool that helps me best get there for, for the many years to come. Really, a strategic purpose. Many times, as as part of a broader digitization transformation uh, effort. Um, and like I said, we have many customers that uh, that select us uh, as part of that. Um, but there's also customers that are saying, well, I I'm, I'm in the midst of um, managing uh, or considering large system upgrades, right? And uh, uh, while I do that, or while I'm going through that multi-year process, typically I want to make sure that I uh, have access to automation uh, benefits. Um, so those customers tend to start out with a more tactical deploy and say, "Okay, I'm going to I'm going to automate processes right around uh, that upgrade um, and, uh, and and reap the benefits from it." I would also say that uh, that RPA enables customers to postpone, you know, upgrade decisions uh, because you know the deficiencies perhaps uh, in uh, in current releases of software uh, that would demand an upgrade uh, can, in many times, be overcome uh, with RPA technology, uh, typically at a fraction of the cost of the actual upgrade. Um, so, so uh, I think the customers have more flexibility in terms of picking the time at which they uh, would uh, would choose. Uh, an upgrade um, uh, uh, moment for for their large uh, ERP systems. Yeah, so I would I would agree with most most of the things that Conrad mentioned. The only other thing that I would like to add is RPA is also enabling um, creation of of roadmaps of products uh, because now you have increased statistics on application usage and functionality usage which you did not have before um, because you relied on users. Uh, to provide that information, but now you have analytics built on built on RPA that can clearly provide you information on, on how the functions and functionality and and certain uh, pages within the within the application is being used uh, at the enterprises. Thank you, Amit. We have time for one more question, and remember that all the questions that were asked today will be passed on to our presenters for. Um, additional remarks after the live broadcast is 
um, completed. So the last question is, what is reasonable to consider in terms of trainings in RPA implementation within an organization? What roles from the RPA implementation can be trained and done in-house? Yeah, it's a, it's a very important question. Uh, we, we probably should have hit on it before we got to this point. I, I would say a couple of things. So a typical center of excellence consists on, let's say, four different roles. One is, you know, a business analyst type role uh, that, that performs, you know, process evaluations and process documentation. Um, and, and, and clearly there's the, uh, there's the need to train um, uh, for that role. And, and UiPath and, and SAPI provide that kind of training, by the way. Um, the second more impactful role, perhaps, uh, and more critical role is the, is the RPA developer. It's really the person that takes that, that, uh, that process assessment and analysis uh, and develops the actual automation uh, and brings it to production, right? I mean, uh, so, so uh, in all enterprise environments we're in, you know, customers uh, will, take, will take that uh, automated piece, uh, run it through, through QA and UAT and all the, all the logical steps. Uh, to bring it to to production and, and UiPath's orchestrator environment actually, uh, you know, helps manage sort of those different steps. But training for RPA developer is key, and and uh, UiPath provides sort of uh, different levels of that training uh, all the way to a full certification, uh, most of which is, is 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 online and free, by the way. Um, but there's also uh, sort of infrastructure and operation uh, uh, roles that that help. Um, uh, ensure that that the underlying infrastructure for uh, a large scale RPA deploy is is well set up. Um, and both Sapient and, and us, we provide a lot of expertise there, including training, uh, and then the operations. Right. So once once a, a bot, uh, a large bot environment is created and operational, you know, it's it's the management of that operation, uh, its overseeing of its of its availability, obviously, uh, just just managing whether the bots are are live or not. Uh, as well as the managing of the inputs and the output, the actual work that's being performed uh, is a specific role. And, uh, you know, uh, URPath provides, uh, like I said, training for all, all those four roles. Amit, do you have anything to add? No, I think Conrad covered it. Very good. Great questions and answers. So on behalf of Penn Energy, I would like to thank today's speakers, Amit Singh and Conrad Vanderpoel. And a big thank you to our sponsor, Sapient Consulting, for today's presentation. This presentation will be archived within 24 hours and can be reached from the homepage at www.penenergy.com. A reminder email message will be sent to all registrants, complete with a direct link to the archive. We thank you very much for joining us today, and we look forward to serving you with more webcasts in the near future. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.